Hello, and many thanks for joining us again on the program, People, Politics, and Power. I am Imoni Amarere. Tempers have been rising across the country of late, particularly amongst the poor and middle-class Nigerians. Even the rich are also complaining and crying. The economy is hard. The cost of living is not only rising, but soaring beyond the reach of many Nigerians. A large percentage of the population can hardly afford the cost of food items and other basic necessities of life. The cost of education is soaring so high that parents are struggling to keep their children in schools. The cost of Medicare and medications are way beyond affordable. Now, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, inflation stood at 28.92% as of December 2023, while food cost was put at 33.93%. Now, the result of this hyperinflation and food crisis is the growing poverty in the land. The immediate cause is directly traceable to the government's removal of petrol subsidy and the floating of the Naira and the poor management of the fallouts of boats. Matters are not being helped by the fact that Nigeria runs an economy that is largely import dependent with little or no domestic production of goods. In the last two weeks, the import exchange rate has been on a yo-yo swing, catapulting prices of imported products further beyond the reach of ordinary Nigerians. In the last couple of weeks, spontaneous protests, or so it seems, have broken out in places like Mina, Kano, Oshobo, Lokoja, Lagos, and Suleja, ostensibly precipitated by hunger and widespread suffering. In response, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu reportedly ordered the release of 102,000 metric tons of various grains, which include rice, maize, millet, and gari, from the National Strategic Reserve, while Rice Millers Association of Nigeria have been asked to bring down the cost of the product, which now says for about 70,000 naira per a 50 kg bag of rice. Now, on top of the prevailing hardships, the labor unions are threatening to ground the economy with another strike in less than 10 days from now as they seek a new minimum wage, amongst other demands from government. There's hardly any doubt that the neoliberal policies of this government, as with other governments before it, are gravely distorting the Nigerian economy and sending many more people below the poverty line. The big question is, how far can the reform policies go? And how much longer can the people endure before these policies begin to have the projected positive impact on their well-being? How much longer can the Naira continue its free fall against major foreign currencies? And how far can the 102,000 metric tons of grains go in alleviating the hunger in the land? What are the options available to government at this point in time? Right, these are the issues we'll be looking at on the program today. And I have a full complement of guest analysts with me in the studio. But before I bring them in, uh, let's take this uh, report, which we set the tone for our discussion. Most families in Nigeria have significantly reduced their food intake. Not that they do not enjoy food anymore, but because they can no longer afford it. The National Bureau of Statistics put food inflation at 33.93% as of December 2023, 
a confirmation of the rising cost in food prices, while headline annual inflation was put at 28.92 within the same period. This viral video clip shows a woman slicing one fish into several pieces to meet the protein needs of her family. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. For others, a bowl of rice is out of reach. Bro, sell out for me two thousand now. Oh God, please, bro. You don't want to me. In the past two weeks, protests have broken out in some states like Niger and Kano. The Niger State Governor Mohamed Bago took more drastic measures by banning trucks taking out food produced in the state. We have stopped mass purchase from our local market in all our local government from now henceforth until further notice. In Abuja, where cost of living is typically high, household incomes have been severely impacted. This is the entrance to the new orange market in Maraba Nasarawa state. It is where farmers bring their produce to sell. This is also the best place for people living in the FCT to come shop at affordable rates. So come with me, let's go inside and find out how cheap cheap is. Things used to cheap here before, not now. Now things are very, very high. Like yesterday we went to Massacre Market. Beans, I said beans here one three on Thursday. I bought it yesterday in Bush Market 15. This Ogbono that I said before, we used to buy the bag 75,000. See them. All I have with me now is 150,000. They brought it for me yesterday. They said that it's 300,000 per bag. We the goosey, how much would they buy them before? We will buy Mudo of the goosey, 17. Now, if we go market, they say that two for last. We saw by, by, by force, now we go sell at 2.5. We are really suffering. This year we are seeing, before it goes for 8,000 naira. Now you see, even we the buyers, we cannot even buy 10,000. You see? Okay, then how much are we going to sell it? You see that she just priced, she has to price, normally she's supposed to buy it for 4,000. She even priced for 5,000 and I can't even sell it. Like this January, February, a bag of carrots, I ain't seen that I will buy. Not more than 10,000. But now what we are buying a bag now is 30,000. I will buy, you will not see anything. Sembovita used to be 9,500 naira. Now it is 11,800 naira. And we sell for 12,000 naira. After talking to traders at the Orange Market, I've come to the realization that things are not as cheap as they used to be in this place. And if things are as expensive as they are now, in this place where it's supposed to be cheap, one can only imagine how much one will buy in town where things are more expensive. To address the acute cost of food prices, the federal government, through the Presidential Committee on Emergency Food Intervention, directed the immediate release of over 100,000 metric tons of grains, including rice, maize and millet, and appealed to those hoarding food to make it available in the market. It did not also rule out the importation of other commodities if what is available is insufficient. Every nation faces emergency situations like this. It's not the first time that it has happened uh, uh, in the world. Many countries of the world have faced this. It's our own time to face this challenge. Uh, government is going to respond adequately and is res already responding adequately. Uh, the president has directed that whatever it will take, uh, food will be available to Nigerians at a cost that is also very reasonable. This intervention is coming at a time when the national currency, the Naira, has fallen rapidly against the dollar, making imported goods item even more expensive. Locally, food production has for years been under threat as farmers have been unable to meet production output due to insecurity. President of All Farmers Association of Nigeria, Kabir Ibrahim, has seen different intervention measures in the past. He's cautiously optimistic of the latest policy. We appreciate the effort and the proactiveness that is coming from government at this time. But let it be more targeted. Let us look at all the regions because there are six geopolitical zones in Nigeria. Try to make available to each geopolitical zone that which is stapled to it. 
Kabir believes the situation can only change sustainably if adequate security is provided to enable farmers to return to their lands. Sensitize people to the fact that for sustainability, the farmers will have to be incentivized to produce optimally. And the government has to do more investments than it has done hitherto, and they should be targeted investments. A significant reduction in cost of food in the next few days will determine if the federal government's intervention is making any impact or forcing more sustainable action. All right, thank you so much for staying with us. That report by our correspondent uh, actually uh, sets the tone for our discussion. And I'm joined right here in the studio by Barrister Eze Onyekpere. Barrister Onyekpere is a fiscal governance specialist and lead director, Center for Social Justice. Thank you so much for joining thank us. You. We are also joined by Mr. Aliko Victor, who is a development economist and a policy analyst. Thank you so much, Mr. Victor, for joining us. Thank you. And also joining us is Dr. Yunusa Halidu Yaboa. He is a National Secretary of Farmers Association of Nigeria, AFAN. Dr. Yaboa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, you're welcome. Right. Now, uh, as it appears, Dr. Onye, uh, Mr. Onyekpere, um, the problem or the challenge we have in Nigeria today it's not new or rather it's not strange to many people. But the question that has been asked is, how did we get here? I want to start by saying that this particular challenge is new. It's more or less a, a mutated variant of maybe old challenges, but this one, the intensity and the gravity of this challenge is beyond what we have witnessed in the past. In no time in the past did we have two key policy issues, like full removal of fuel subsidy. You know, in the past, it used to be you remove five naira or 10 naira. This is full. Under Jonathan, it was partial. Under Abacha, it was partial. But this is full from 190 naira to 670. So you are talking about 460 to 470 naira per liter, gained by government, withdrawn by government on every liter of petroleum sold. And you are selling maybe tens of millions of liters every day. You're talking of the floating of the Naira, which wasn't done before. So this is actually a new challenge. And my perception of what has happened is that we have misinterpreted policy reforms, you know, to say this is a bold reforms. You know, we've misinterpreted it in a way that it has, you know, started challenging, you know, the idea of reforms in the first place, saying these reforms, whether they're good or bad. What has happened is every individual is expected to anticipate the natural consequences of every action or omission. Therefore, the government should have sat down before announcing these policy reforms to do simulations, to do projections of what will likely happen if you do this. And then you come up with mitigation strategies to you know, the challenges that you are going to face. So for me, what the government did, particularly what Mr. President did at Ego Square, without even looking at the books, saying first subsidy is gone. I want to say that it was not bold. Rather, it's in retrospect now, it's appearing to be reckless, not boldness. He, because he should have looked at the books, have his committee in place, the committee that will be monitoring the events as it's unfolding, and then you do cost correction as it's unfolding. It's just like he announced it and went to bed. So it's like a doctor came and saw that, Mark, you need a surgery. Something is wrong. Everybody agrees you need a surgery. But he must look at you very well. Look at your blood pressure. Apply anesthesia. This is an operation with a sharp knife without anything to prevent you. So you are getting the pain raw and direct. But for the operation, it was necessary. But the way a mannered operation has been handled has making it in such a way that the person who is supposed to benefit may likely die from the surgery. Mm. So, v Victor, uh, the situation as it is today, can we attribute it only to the uh, removal of subsidy and the floating of the Naira? Are there other things, for instance, that may, may be contributing to the current uh, high cost of living that we're having? The fact that, like we heard in that report, the cost of food items has soared beyond the reach of ordinary Nigerians. 
Is it just the issue of removal of the subsidy, the issue of insecurity as we have it across Nigeria today, and the floating of the land? Well, uh, in my opinion, I would say these are not the major issues. Although it can be attributed, according to my colleague, as the key issue at the moment behind the high cost of living. However, we cannot deny the fact that Nigeria has witnessed decades of misrule in the past, part of which the current administration is partly inheriting a failed economy. But then um, the current policies, as rightly pointed out by my colleague, is the major reason behind the challenges we are facing. So I wrote an article on business day and part of my argument was that Nigeria was not ready for subsidy removal. And part of the reasons I highlighted is the same thing my colleague have said, the Mr. President should have sat down to understand the issues first. He gave a fantastic analogy, a patient who is not feeling fine, you need to conduct a diagnostic test to find out exactly what is wrong because you can actually give a prescription that might seemingly look correct but not actually what will help the patient. So Mr. President, in my opinion, was wrong removing subsidy, announcing subsidy removal on his first day being inaugurated as president. Then the second thing I would also mention is insecurity has been largely responsible for the rise in food costs. It is, it is, it is something that is clear to everybody. Uh, farmers can no longer go to the farm. The issue of production in the past is also an issue we must contend with. So in the past, previous administrations have failed to industrialize Nigeria. This is also part of the issue. Again, the floating of the Naira is another big and contentious issue that I think is responsible for our current predicament. So we can't rule out these three issues, insecurity, floating of the Naira, and total removal of sub fuel subsidy. These are the key issues, but again, not the only issue where we find ourselves where we are at the moment. Hmm. Dr. Halidu, let, let's come to you. You are a practicing farmer, right? And we, we, we heard your president say in that report that well, the, the cost of food prices is on the upward swing. Almost every food item is uh, beyond, almost beyond the reach of ordinary Nigerians now. And we, we, we're just wondering whether or not, uh, like I said, farmers are no longer going to their farms or it is costing much more to produce food. Which is which? Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, the problem, as uh, my two colleagues rightly said, presently today in Nigeria, cost of production, especially food, you see, farmers, agriculture is a business like any other business. It's no longer a, 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 a just go to farm for your consumption. It's a business. So whatsoever you produce, there's a cost of production. There's economic cost of, cost of production for every crop in Nigeria. So you cannot produce at a high cost and sell it at a low cost. What is the problem? Removal of oil, so, oil subsidy today, diesel is very expensive. You can't plow a, 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 a one hectare of tractor with 15,000 like before. You can plow a one hectare of tractor of a land with 70, 80, 100,000 naira uh, for one hectare. And if you are, if you are pumping uh, with using uh, foil for, for water pumps, water pump before 15, 16, 20,000 naira, today 100,000 naira and above. All this one, a farmer does not know, but in as much as is your business, if you are able to afford it, as you, because you have your cost of production. Your cost of production is hiking every day. So tractor alone, some six, seven years back, a tractor was 10, seven, 10 million naira. Today, you can't find a tractor for 25 million naira in Nigeria today. Everybody is complaining about dollar, dollar, dollar. Some tractors have been in this country for the past 10 years but they are still attributing it to dollars. So everybody has his own problem. You understand? The cost is the government should definitely come down to the, to the level of the farmers. We are saying it's expensive. It's because you cannot afford it. Civil servant now, people are talking about minimum wage. What is the, what is the minimum wage of a civil servant? A civil servant, a small civil servant is receiving 100,000 naira. And you want him to be living from Maraba to Abuja every day with 100,000 naira transportation alone can even finish this money and you want him to be to survive we are saying it's expensive of exactly expensive because you cannot afford it in those days in the 70s how much was car 
below a thousand, what many people could not still afford the car because it was expensive because they don't have the money. Now the money is just, in Nigeria, people have 10, 15, 20 cars in their houses. You know, they don't care they, because there are a lot of problems, my brother. People must come back to their level. Government must look at every Nigerian must come back to their level. Security agencies must look at somebody, a civil servant of a colleague of yours, who you are in the same office with, you see him building houses, buying houses in Abuja because it's opportune to be in an, in, a, in an office where you are not there. And you are, you, you are all in the same rank. Nobody look at that. Nobody cares. You, you, see, you see the problem. Corruption everywhere. Government policy is also contributing to it. Uh, economic problem is there. International factors is also there. Uh, somebody was talking about climate change. It's also there. These are all natural phenomena. But government must come, come down to the level of everybody to look at how do we tackle this. The government is only to sit down in an office where there's air condition. Who is your, who is your, your next government? Your next government is the next person to you. Your, sen your, your councillor, a councillor in a local government, does not even know how many people are within his, 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 his what that voted for him. After vote, they voted for him, he goes somewhere, you see them floating with big, big cars, nobody cares. You understand the problem. The, the reason is the government must listen to the people that voted them to power. Mr. President says they should, they should, they should bring 100,000 metric tons of, 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 uh, of grain. Grains, yeah. To who? How? Who, who, who takes the grain? All this grain will still go back to the market people and will still come back to the, to the farm. To, to, to the, to the, to Nigerian cannot still afford it because there's no good monitoring and evaluation process of how this grain will be distributed. The people that are hungry are there. If, they, if the government like, they should bring 1,000 millions, 1 billion metric tons of, of grain to this country, people will still hold it. There are grants in Nigeria. There are grants in this country. The, Nigeria, look, let me tell you what is happening in this country. All these people crying, there's no grant, there's, there's grant. Nigeria has, even the fact that there's food, there's insecurity. People sit down with their money, corrupt money, stealing money. They keep, once there is harvest, September, October, no, November, they go into the market, they buy this grain at any cost. They ship it to neighboring countries and keep it there. When you enter April, April May, there's food, there's grain scarcity. They will tell the government, open the border. There's, grass, there's a crisis of food in Nigeria. Please, government, open border. If government open border, the same grain that they brought, until people are crying that they should open border. Who is producing in which country? Can't you produce? We have good farmland. We have good uh, 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 human resources. The fact that there is insecurity, insecurity did not contribute even 10% to stop production in Nigeria. Let me tell you, I'm a farmer. I don't have any business. I'm not a civil servant. I'm not a politician. I don't have any business apart from farming. So I know, I know there is insecurity, but it does not contribute to that high cost of, uh, of food in the market. The only thing that contributes to high cost is the high cost of production. Hmm. Before, our high co our, you, can, you, uh, you can produce a rice with 120,000 naira per hectare. Today, you can produce rice with 800,000 naira per hectare. Anywhere in Nigeria. Mm. Mr. Yekberi, let's try and relate uh, this uh, scenario that he has painted now to the foreign exchange component of uh, uh, our dealings as a country. Because I'm aware that in the last uh, couple of weeks, the exchange rate has been on a swing. And that uh, added to the fact that we, as Nigerians seem to have a penchant uh, for foreign goods and products. And that uh, has in itself impacted on, the, on how much we pay for what we consume. I think it's a wonderful analysis he did, like the cost of diesel today. The last time I knew it was 1,275. And you have to put how many liters in a tractor for some hours. And of course, that adds to your cost of producing the grains or the tubers or whatever you are producing. Even if you are producing animals in a regulated environment, that will also add to your cost. Um, one thing I want to disagree with before I come back to this issue of the currency exchange is about insecurity. In some parts of Nigeria today, farmers can no longer go to their farms. Indeed, I have a colleague in my office from Plateau State, she did tell me that they do not have an ancestral village to go back to again. 
they've been sacked, and those who sacked them occupied those villages. And they can't go back, so not to talk of farming. So in so many parts of places like Nai Benue and Plateau, there is this challenge, and it's creeping across a number of other states. But beyond that, going back to the foreign exchange component, that's why I was saying that there needed to have been pre- and post-interventions accompanying the floating of the Naira and accompanying the fuel subsidy removal. If you recall, we were all alive. When the then uh, Abacha removed a little, a few pennies in fuel subsidy, he set up the PTDF and made former President Buhari the person to manage it. The much maligned Jonathan, when he removed a few pennies from fuel subsidy, he set up Shaw P. Now, the question today is, where is the money that has been saved, both at the state level and at the federal level? We are discussing money that runs into three to four, five trillion every year. Where is that money? What, we were told that they are going to convert some buses to be run with CNG. Where are the buses that have been converted? Where are those that have been imported? You know, apart from uh, agriculture food, the president is considering making an executive order for the pharmaceutical and health sector to reduce the cost of medicines. He will also have to make an executive order for students and the cost of education. He will also do for transportation. So that's why I'm insisting that these two policies need to be rejected. First of all, let me give you a concrete thing that needs to be done. The major source of earning foreign exchange today is oil and gas. Now, under the former government, we had an NMPC, which either by omission or commission, could not even meet up our open quota. Under Jonathan, we were doing 2.1 million barrels a day. At some point, we were started doing less than 1, 1 million barrels. Today, we are doing about 1.3, 1.4. Now, if such a person presided over this and no money was being remitted to the Federation account, is either he was grossly negligent or he had no capacity or under him resources were being looted. The expectation is not to reward failure. He should have been sacked. And a new management put in place to move to the next level where we could set a target to say, let us target 2 million barrels a day for the in the next six months. And if you're able to do that, and that means you will likely tech. double, yes, you will likely double your tech from crude oil sell. And the implication is that you have more dollars to be able to defend the value of the Naira. We were rejoicing when Dangote refineries was announced to be coming on board because we are saying about 35% of our imports is crude, is a refined petroleum product. So we are saying we will save that much. Now it's become clear that nothing will be saved. You know why? Dangote can no longer source crude, the crude feed from Nigeria. He has ordered crude oil from where? America. So we are no longer able. So whatever we should have gained from stopping importing, assuming we stop importing, the money foreign exchange we are use, going to use now to import the crude feed stock. So what happened? We mortgaged our oil for years, taking the money off road, blowing it away, and we can't see where it was invested. So the first major thing is that we should talk about petroleum industry reforms. And unfortunately, Mr. President has put the petroleum minister under his armpit. He's a substantive minister, just like the former president was also the substantive minister of petroleum. So that should be the starting point. And of course, reducing the cost of governance. What we have seen is that the cost of the bureaucracy has increased. You talked about local patronizing local made goods and services. All we saw was the National Assembly and the presidency rush to go and buy SUVs, the 2023 specs at 160 million each. And why we had the innocence and the local companies here that we could have bought from. You know what it means? Because I calculated across the MDAs at the federal and state level, across the houses of assembly, across the judiciary, the number of vehicles, new vehicles they bought is not less than 10,000. And each of these SUVs are in the category of 100 million and above. Do you know the implication to the Nigerian economy of asking either innocent, okay, let me not start calling brands, asking any particular company, set of companies to give us 10,000 SUVs. First of all, they will hire more Nigerians. When they hire more Nigerians, they will increase their production capacity, they will make more profit. When they make more profit, they are going to pay more corporate income tax. 
to the government. They are all the, those they employed are going to pay more personal income tax. So it's going to be a win-win for the economy. So if Mr. President is serious, let him lead by example. It's not a question of rhetoric or stories because all we have seen, for instance, the executive budget proposal for the National Assembly was 196 million. When they eventually passed it, they ended up giving themselves 344 billion. The one for the judiciary was about 170 something. When they passed it, they ended up giving themselves about 340 something. So it's like the last time we had during Christmas, the president said he released some money or grants through National Assembly members. Who did he get to? So even if you release a million metric tons, you know what's likely to happen? And you pass it through the bureaucracy of the parties and the political listing, they will still share it among themselves. It will still come out to the market at the current market price. And that is why I was saying, if there were plans in place, for instance, we could have contemplated food stamps. Exactly. We, use the, we use the BVM, you use the national identity management uh, cards, you use all those driver's license, all those data, even INEC voting cards, all those packs of data we've connected, we could have used them to say, because if they're giving grants, I don't think, Mike, will, you will queue up. I don't think I will queue up. I don't think anybody on this table we queue up. But the way it's going, people who are far bigger than us, 10 times richer than us, are going to benefit from these grants, and the people who are actually supposed to get it will not get anything. All right. So the, the question is, what are the options that are available to government and to ordinary Nigerians? We'll come back to uh, answer that question right after this time out. Stay with us. Nigeria is experiencing one of its worst surges in kidnapping. Children are whisked from school buses, travelers are ambushed by gunmen, and families are taken away from their homes. The perpetrators show no mercy. It's about ransom money or human lives, and it has become a thriving business enterprise. Who are behind these acts, and why do they seem to be two steps ahead of Nigeria's security forces? Join us on AIT's special town hall as a panel of security experts, policymakers, and kidnapped survivors dissect the problem and profile solutions. Date, Thursday, February 15, 2024. Time, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. The town hall will be broadcast live on Africa Independent Television, AIT, and all its social media handles. All right. Uh uh, Victor, l let's come back to looking at options that are available now. The challenges and the problems are too well known and clearly enumerated. What are the options that are available for government? Should there be a reconsideration of these so-called reform policies? Or should there be uh, a major turnaround of every system that can help to aid this uh, process to make life more meaningful for Nigerians? Fantastic question. Uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And the first thing I would say is Mr. President should himself and his economic team should sit down and admit that the policies are not working. The second thing I think the government must do is what I, is, these are recommendations now. First, Mr. President need to have what I call a brain trust. A brain trust by that, it was first used by former American president, Franklin Roosevelt, where he had a team of experts, both from opposition side and from his economic team, that can tell truth to power. Experienced individuals, not individuals who are seeking for recognition, but individuals who will tell Mr. President the real issue. There are assumptions that there was a former president in Nigeria whom every morning the newspaper he reads is different from the newspaper that is sold across the streets of Nigeria. So they tell him stories that his government is performing, whereas it's entirely different from what the reality is. That's number one. Then number two, we cannot uh, deny the fact that we must tackle insecurity. If I'm Mr. President, send all the chief, the army chiefs, security chiefs, the minister of defense, send them to the forest to lead by example. We must tackle insecurity for us to cut down the cost of, of uh, food I items. believe that the previous uh, Again? administration did something in that, yeah. along that line, but uh, didn't, uh, produce the kind of results, results that was expected. Exactly. Then another thing I also think we must do as a nation is that Nigerians must sit down to demand for accountability from our leaders. So we have had a situation where 
uh, if, if, you, if you look at the, 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 our economic indicators, poverty surging, inflation is 33.93%. Minimum wage is nothing to write home about. Corruption is surging. So Mr. President must display, he must lead by example, display the body language that is interested in cutting down the cost of governance. My colleague has, Barristan Yeku has done justice to that, given analysis of what is being spent. Again, we must come back to a production economy. We can't deny that fact. Although this may be long-term measures, but the policies for subsidy removal must be revisited. I would also recommend a subsidy audit. So all the money that has been spent on subsidies in the past, the government, Mr. President, must probe those monies, understand where these monies have entered and who is responsible for that. That's another th step forward. Another thing I think is also very critical for us to do is we must incentivize farmers. It is, it is very important. We must incentivize our farmers. We must small scale industries in Nigeria. They must have funds for them to grow their businesses. If we're also looking at cost of production, some analysts which I also support have been of the opinion that the tariffs they are increasing at the, at the borders in our ports, it, 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 will, it will fuel inflation in our economy. And when it fuels inflation, it has a multiplier effect or ripple effect on Nigerians. Again, let's not forget that there's a strong link between the economic performance or income level of a country and insecurity. So I want to see a situation where when they're having National Security Council meeting, they will have the Minister of Finance as part of that meeting. Because looking at the issue of addressing poverty, it's not only a responsibility for Mr. President alone, even if he bores most of the responsibility. The governors must be fully involved. The local government chairman, who are closer to the people must be fully involved. Again, another solution I would also recommend is there must be, there must be public service reform, which I think is super important. Any policy of government must be implemented by the public service. So the current head of service, Professor Tunjo Lokpa, whom I know is an advocate of public service reform, must reform Nigeria's public service. It's, it's, in a, it's, in, it's in a mess, if I will use that word. What we have in public service today, it has become a, a, a place where you see chronism, clientism, favoritism, where certain agencies of government, once you get to a position of becoming a director, you must bring somebody who will replace you as you're living. So we must have a strong public service to implement government policies for our country to work. These are part of the recommendations. The public also, service reforms has been ongoing for so long. I, mean, I wonder where, where and when it will ever end and whether or not yeah. it's making uh, the desired impact at all. But Dr. Yunusa, let, let, let's look at uh, immediate, uh, medium and long-term solutions to the problem. Well, we've just talked about the over 100,000 uh, tons of grain that the president has ordered to be released uh, to the public, to Nigerians. And the, f and the fact that everyone doubts that we not get to the, those who need this grain. Uh, and, uh, and so you, you, you look at these uh, policies and these directives and wonder whether or not government is actually sincere from the world go when it, when it puts out some of these things. How far and how long can 100,000 or more grains, tons of grain, go in alleviating or at least reducing the kind of tension that was beginning to build up in Nigeria today? We, 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 had, we have had uh, demonstrations, protests here and there, and there's a likelihood that this may continue. How do we arrest that kind of situation? Thank you very much. And uh, I will just have, uh, my colleague has said a very good uh, this thing here. I will only contribute in one or two things. Uh, um, 100,000 metric of grain in Nigeria, into Nigeria, a population of over 200 million Nigerians. If you divide 100,000 metric ton to Nigeria, is that even up to one kg per, per person? If everybody will get it, is that even up to one kilogram per Nigerian? That is one. So the, my own point is, if so we are talking about government should in, 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 in incentivize farmers, of course, it's good. But how? They have been doing that, but it's not working. You know why it's not working? Because the incentive, the inputs government give to farmers in the name of subsidy goes back to the, to, to the input suppliers. I have been agitating this thing. I said, look, in many countries, government do not 
subsidized inputs. Government subsidized what? Price. Opposite is the other way because they are benefiting from what? The, 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 the input supplier and other things. But if today government say, look, I'm going to, I'm going to subsidize food price, in, uh, commodity price, all of us will sit down, tomato, rice, maize, wheat, everything, we know the cost of production per each. Bwari wanted to do that 2016, but it couldn't work. Corruption engulfed everything, didn't work. The, the point is like this. If we say, okay, fine, government must be rigid that I'm going to subsidize food price. If, the, if you are producing rice, you definitely, if you cannot produce because the market is only one, it's between you and the government. Anybody buying, is either you're buying from the government or you're buying from, from the person through the government hand. What, what am I talking about? If government, if back of rice is 70,000 naira now, government say, okay, anybody who has back of rice, sell it to the market at 70,000, at, at 30,000, then as you come, I will give you 40,000. So if you did not, because nobody will buy it from you at 31,000 because he will not even make profit because it's the same market, it will go. You understand? That is how it's applicable in many countries. Today, I had the governor of Niger say, saying that he will stop uh, people to, to buy uh, grain out of his state. How? I have my grain. I have a ton or two in my, in my warehouse I want to sell. I want to take my child to the hospital. I don't have a buyer in Niger. So somebody come from Kwara and said, I won't sell to him. Did you contribute it in my production? The answer is no. How do you want to do that? You understand? If government say, okay, fine. Say, if you want to sell, bring it, I will buy. That's another different thing. But you can't say somebody, get that out. Is, that this government should buy from the farmer, yes. from the producer. At a very, at, at, at a very targeted price. Yes. You, so nobody will bring it from somewhere. Any price they bring, this is my own standard price. And this is my market price. If government agrees that, you see that the only price only through from the government to the people. You will never see different. That's how it is applicable in all countries in the world, apart from Nigeria. You will only have two prices from the government and to the consumers. That is how government will regulate. And how do government do? If you want to do the subsidy, subsidize it in that form. If you want to incentivize them, do it in that form. But in as much as you said, don't, don't do this. You can't say, if you say, get out. If I say, get, where do I go? You must provide, go and sit down there. I want, to, I want to, 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 to renovate this place. I want to do this. The policy must, the policies must do what? If government say, do this, I'm going to do like this. Why am I saying so is, he said, nobody should mop grain. In the, of course, I like it. But what of other states that are not producing grain? They are also, your state, is, is your state producing everything? The answer is no. So they should not buy other commodities. We are From doing commodity states, trading yeah. in Nigeria today. We, in our association, we are doing commodity trading with people in the East. They give us palm oil, we take it to Sokoto, KB, and other things. They carry grain, and, and we take it to them. We are doing this, it has been happening within our own as an association. But you say now, the somebody should not move that. How? Is Niger said producing every food? The answer is no. Uh, let, let me even add to this. I think uh, subsidizing agriculture has been ongoing, but a good part of the challenge is corruption. You it's recall corruption. the Anko mm -hmm. program, where credit was being made available supposedly to small-scale farmers and uh, merge them with off-takers so that it could be easy for them to farm. All we saw was that there were a lot of political farmers, those who mm -hmm. don't have farms, but they you could register farms. a company overnight, XYZ Agriculture, and because you have put on good suits, you are well connected to the corridors of power, and you get a large chunk of the money. That is it. And many of them took it. They didn't even put it in farming, and they were expecting that they will not pay back. Uh, yes. It's only recently that they are pursuing some of them. Now, that brings me also to the issue of the social register. The register that has the, the thing that has put the minister in mm -hmm. trouble. We need a proper social register, which will identify the poorest of the poor. And that social register doing it is possible. Like I've told you, we've collected a lot of data from voters, Kazu, to NIMSI, to BAV well. and census, uh, registration, all kinds of. We can use it to sieve out the real poor people in Nigeria. You see, part of what was happening in that office was that these monies that they're collecting without, you know, individuals are collecting could easily be stolen. That's the challenge. Because that same register, was also being used 
to inform the basic health care provision fund, those who benefit under the that basic health care provision fund. Exactly. And they are receiving evidence and information that most of these people whose name are on the register are not supposed to be there in the first place. And so, if you have this register, that's why I was talking about food stamps. That's why it will be easy to see a real poor person and the government can give you a stamp, something like a check, go there, present it, and you collect a certain quantity of food for you and your family. Will that one not be corrupted also? No, no, no. I'm saying if we remove corruption, if the people at the helm of affairs don't want corruption, it won't happen. But here is a, a situation where people begin to ask to benefit what is in there for them in the first place, either as members of the executive or the legislature. And once you have that kind of mindset, any program you design will be corrupted. And that's why I support the idea that Nigerians have to be more, let me use the word aggressive, not aggressive in terms of fighting people, but to demand more. Because I had a government official saying that those who were demonstrating in Niger and Kanu were being paid. moved, paid by politicians. But, that, but that's not true. That's, that's not true. These are women going to the market. The people you interview, they are hungry. They are entitled to be angry. It's only in Nigeria that you push people to the wall. Instead of fighting back, they want to break the wall and go to the other side of it. Mm -hmm. But we can't continue doing that forever. So I expect that Nigerians are going to have a pushback to begin to ask questions. Like I, he said, why don't we do an audit on the oil subsidy? Okay? Why don't we ask questions what happened to oil? Even the former Emir Sanusi has asked an MPC, where are the dollars? Where is, where is the dollars? And that's why I'm asking, where is the money we are saving from fuel subsidy removal? Where is the money? Mm. And, Which projects and, and, is it dedicated to? So, so, so I, I want to add something to what he's saying. So if you look at the budget was a clear example of our economic priorities or the priority of the current administration. 5% was given to health care. Less, less, than, less than 10 to 15% from the Abuja declaration mm -hmm. for African countries to have percentage of their budget. You look at education, just 7%, below UNESCO's 26% of your budget. So it shows you the, the economic priority of this current administration. So we, we can have a situation where there are certain set of persons who sit down without understanding the real issues that is wrong with the economy. They make policies in abstraction. So what you find most times is what we call policy incoherence. You have policies that are overlapping, policies that are incoherent. There are some assaulting. There are some assaulting. So you have a situation where you're telling somebody who is hungry. In fact, this whole conversation we're having here, if Nigerians cannot see food on their table, that's, that's the concern of an average Nigerian. They don't care about the economic policies. They don't care about what they go. The people want to see food on their tables. So if you're in Nigeria today and you're having three square meal, I can bet you, 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 must, you must be among the very few unfortunate Nigerians. If you, if, you, if you look at the issue of poverty, which is a core issue today, when we talk of poverty, we're talking of people's inability to have access to social services like education, healthcare, safety is an issue, prosperity, wealth. You're talking of issues like employment. It's a big issue. So we have a population of over 210 million Nigerians. And if you look at our labor force, our labor force is about 80 million Nigerians. Out of that labor force, we have a huge percentage of them that are unemployed. So at the end of the day, if you, if you look at active working population in Nigeria, it's within 70 to 60 million people. What does it imply? That one out of every three Nigerians is what is sustaining our economy. It then brings to the argument where some persons will say, we are giant of Africa by population. We are giant of Africa by the biggest economy in Africa. But then, in terms of poverty, if you look at what poverty clock today, that says 71 million Nigerians are extremely poor, living below $1.9 per day. And without, with the current exchange rate, the value to Naira is even deteriorating. So these are contentious issues that the government must sit down. And that's why I talked about the brain trust. If you ask me, we have individuals like Reverend Kuka from Sokoto Diocese. We have individuals like Sanusi Lamido. We have individuals like uh, 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 Osita Chidoka, the likes of Professor uh, Patu uh, Tomi. These are in fantastic individuals who might not even be in the party of Mr. President. But I can tell truth to power and say, Mr. President, these policies are not working. These are the real realities on ground. Because it's possible that those around Mr. President are not telling him the truth. He doesn't yeah, understand yeah, the real yeah, issues. He doesn't. Okay. Uh, he made, very quickly, he made uh, reference to the return of commodity boards. 
Is that uh, one uh, area we should be looking I'm, at? I'm a little bit worried about government becoming buying up goods because mm. yes, this morning before I left the house, I think it was eight. It was showing where they were breaking up a warehouse in Kano, complaining that some people we are hoarding goods. And I was saying, I mean, if I have goods I imported or whatever or I have bought in Nigeria and I've not been able to sell them, are they not supposed to be in a warehouse? The same government we say is corrupt. If it becomes the government to buy up the goods, they could possibly buy one million metric tons and in the books they will record two. And the balance of the money, somebody will pocket it. So it turns back that we need reforms of the service and the political culture before you give me money. Mm. Or I give you money to go and buy one million tons. If I don't follow you to the place, whatever you write in the books is what will take. But at the end of the day, what you write or what I write may not be the truth. Mm. The, the point is we have to look at what happened in the 80s. It was working. Why not now? We, it, was, it works. In the First Republic? Or in the first republic. first republic. Yes, yes, it works. Why not now? What I'm saying is... Are you going to bring to life no, 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 no. Who, you see, you see the first there's, one, there's one thing we have to... There's something you mentioned here. You said there are things that if you say go and queue up for one bag of rice, all of us, I don't think nobody will, will go there. But Nigeria is a country whereby if we have to look at... These are things that I, I am above it. We have to have a self-discipline. First and foremost, this is another thing. If they say this thing is And free, we have to acquire that before we begin to move all this in that thing, direction. Very good. Because, you see, if, if, if they say today, there's a trailer of rice here in Abuja, here, it's for free. I am telling you before man and God, you will see councillors, senators, local government chairman will be queuing up to go and get this they one back. They will not even queue up. No, they, they will not queue up. What they, they will, will do, they will, they will tell you to wait. Let us go and in design policy framework that, that to is share the rice. So, so and by the time they come back, half of the rice will this be This self the rice will be applied. <laughs> our religion leaders, our traditional leaders, our security uh, agencies, our policy makers, we must develop this self-discipline, first and foremost. Mm. This is another primary. You see, what I'm saying is, Nigerians are the one of the most patient people in the world. Mm -hmm. You correct. just elect a senator that has, his house is even, the, his, the roof is bl blown off. When you go to National Assembly in two months, three months, you see that he started building that house, because, turning it to Because Nigeria. he gets, because, because he, he gets, there's a new creature. Yeah. There's security. I mean, yeah, he gets the kind of you allowances see, that you, see, you see, never see, imagine in your his, life. His so. driver, his security, his cook, his gardener, you see them receiving 25,000, 30,000 naira. And you see them burning millions every day. These are things that we are very patient. Somebody mm. can just look. No, I can't continue living like that. We must have self-discipline. Let okay. everybody enjoy it. You are not that, bringing that this money from our, our time is up. We must go. Thank you so much for Thank your you time. Very much. Thank, Thank you, you. Dr. Yusa Halidu. Yaboa is the National Secretary of Farmers Association of Nigeria. E -F -A -N. Thank you for your time. Thank you very and much. Mr. Aliko Victor is a development economist and policy analyst. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Thank of you. course, Barrister Eze Oyekwere, fiscal uh, governance specialist and lead director. Center for Social Justice. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thank you very much. I right, thank you, Avias, for uh, spending your time with us. We hope that uh, you have at least gained one or two things today. And like my guests say, it is a collective responsibility to put Nigeria back on the path to prosperity. My name is Imoni Amarere. Bye for now.